Hello and welcome everyone to the Technology is Running MX session. We are at a really extraordinary time and really appropriate uh, to the, the name of the session um, and name of this conference. Uh, usually Harasses uh, is in Portugal every year and we're meeting virtually around the world with a very esteemed group of uh, professionals, leaders, technology leaders, and indeed practitioners. Uh, so I'm very happy to be um, to be moderating and sharing this panel today. Uh, my name is Navrup Sadev, and I'm the founder CEO of the Digital Economist, which is a global impact platform mm -hmm. focused on uh, converging tech, focused on building human-centered technology and anchoring it to sustainability and human-centered outcomes. So it's my uh, privilege, it's my honor to welcome everyone here and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we will just do a quick round of introductions. I'm sure you've looked at the speakers yourself. Um, so we'll just take a minute and uh, please everyone introduce yourself, uh, starting with Dave. That's not yeah. correct. Uh, good, uh, good day, everyone, or good evening, whatever time is on your end. Uh, my name is uh, David. David Smith. I'm president and CEO of Sandra Sack LLC. We're a satellite communications company. We provide voice data and streaming video via uh, aeronautical, land mobile, and maritime. Um, and um, we work in several different uh, spheres. We work in government, commercial, and international market. And I just want to introduce myself. We provide 24-7 end-to-end solutions and keep you connected real, uh, real, real time any place in the world. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, maybe we'll do the, the next David right after that. Yeah, well, I'm David Bremer, and I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Weightless. And Weightless is focused on providing mobility solutions, usually deployed in a smart city context. But what it really boils down to is we've created next generation GPS. And we believe that by enhancing GPS and limiting error, it can allow many different things to be more accurate, efficient, and reliable and safe. So examples are connected vehicles, autonomous driving, door-to-door -door robotic delivery, uh, but even more basic things like um, uh, ride sharing. So we, we think it's a big benefit and contact tracing is sort of the latest uh, use case that could be, you know, uh, it's going to be enhanced by having better positioning. Great. Thank you, David. Um, Edson, would you like to go next? Good morning, good afternoon, good e evening. My name is Edson Prestes. I'm a professor in the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. I've been working for more than 20 years in robotics, artificial intelligence, humanitarian application, and recently in ethics and human rights. I'm a member in the UN Secretary General High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation. I'm also a member of the ad hoc group, uh, UNESCO ad hoc group for the recommendation of artificial intelligence, uh, ethics of artificial intelligence. Thank you so much. Thank you, Edson. Good to have you here. Vivian? Hi, I'm Vivian Guo. I'm the president of the uh, Jacksonville Artificial Intelligence Group. Our this is a not-for-profit uh, group, and our goal is to bring and bridge um, outside business companies mm -hmm. and our local talents in the AI arena. Right now, due to the pandemic, uh, our basically expansion plan is put on hold. So right now, we are hold, uh, basically hold uh, events to uh, increase the knowledge and awareness of AI uh, in Jacksonville uh, area. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, Dan. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Mapes. Uh, I'm the uh, founder and president of uh, Versus.io. Uh, we're an artificial intelligence company based in California. Uh, I'm also the founder of the uh, Spatial Web Foundation and the Spatial Web Protocol. That's a new layer to the Internet. Uh, the original internet is a web of pages, uh, but as David Bremer just pointed out on the panel here, I mean, now smart cities are the next big thing. Uh, we need an interoperability layer that links everything together in smart cities and between cities and around the world. And so we have that now with the, uh, with the spatial web protocol. Great. Thank you, Dan. Uh, 
So exciting, super interesting. And I think one of the things to notice about this panel is that it covers um, practitioners working in the industry, um, academic scholars, but also works uh, working closely with uh, with policy, um, and referring to you here, and, and also David Smith. So it's it's super exciting and and so timely at this point to be discussing this. And you know we are facing a um, a quadruple crisis, perhaps uh, with uh, the health crisis with COVID nineteen, an economic crisis uh, with a recession that we don't know when it's going to end, um, and then a social crisis, of course, uh, that has. Um, that has, you know, uh, ensued as a result of that, uh, starting with uh, racial inequality and, and injustice. Um, but also now, more than any other time, um, the climate crisis is, is here and now, right? Um, it's interesting because 2020 marks the 75th anniversary of the United Nations General Assembly and the Secretary General just gave the opening remarks for, for this conference as well. Um, and 50th anniversary of the World Economic Forum, uh, another anniversary for the Earth Year, and so on and so forth. So I think in the community, there was always a, a sense of 2020 being a very important year. And uh, in, in, in that sense, it is a turning point uh, with a tragic set of uh, events leading up to it. Uh, but I think the reason why we gathered here today, of course, is to discuss what that uh, turning point uh you know, mean and might mean in, in moving into the future, right? And what does it look like, again, from a technological point of view? Uh, so kind of my question for, for the panelists here, first and foremost, um, I think, uh, Dan, it would be great to start with yourself, um, as to what is the role of technology in a world that is grappling with a many-fold crisis at the same time? Sure. Well, fundamentally, we have 8 billion people on the planet headed toward 10 billion. We've got 2 billion more coming in the next 25 years. So we have to use technology uh, to manage the uh, situations, uh, whether that's making our cities smarter and more sustainable and, and uh, serving people more effectively, uh, whether it's using artificial intelligence and blockchains and cryptocurrencies. These are just things that we we're forced to use because we have to grapple with all of these issues you just pointed out, or <laughs> we're going to have a terrible dystopia. So uh, we, we can't really be afraid of the technology. We have to engage it, uh, use it wisely, uh, find out where the weaknesses are and mitigate those and uh, really play to their strengths. If we do this right, uh, we're going to have something that looks like Star Trek in 2100. If we do it wrong, it's going to look like something like Blade Runner. Right on. Um Great. Um, I'll invite the other panelists to jump in here. I know everybody has um, a very strong set of background working and grappling with this issue on what the responsible build out of tech should look like. Um, and so I'll invite the panelists to jump in. Okay. Um, David Smith, Sandra said, um, on, satellite ne on satellite technology for the current situation that we're in we're facing one of the things that you'll see happening and probably all you have experienced um when your network is not working or it's running slow or it goes down because a lot of times it's overloaded with so many users and with satellite technology and you know with sandra said we give you the ability to keep you connected 24 7 so Putting an infrastructure of satellite into different regions will allow you to not only have, you know, bandwidth and, 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 and being able to stay connected, it will also give you the ability to do surveillance, track, um, facial recognition over the satellite, banking transactions over the satellite. Um, these are some of the things that um, satellite technology can do, and, it's, and also tracking certain situations, certain, certain situations, remote areas when say COVID-19, you have to go in and do testings and the medical uh, community have to go in and basically um, in areas that they don't have communication, they can, they can um, gather the data from satellite technology and still be able to uh, uh, come up with the same results if they were back in, 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 a, in a medical facility, a hospital, that sort of nature. So in satellite and in this current situation, staying connected is, is the key um, and, and, and whether you're traveling by air, which um, our company, you know, you're on, you're on by air, you want to stay connected, 
or on land or on, on maritime, you're out at the ocean or whatever. This is what satellite technology do. We and so um, machine to machine, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence. As I connect in with them, they have another pipe that they, they, that they can, um, you know, if they need to use data, they can use that data, and that's what satellite technology is able to do. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, while taking, uh, I'm Vivian Guo, and I uh, want we'll to uh, just uh, bring up uh, security issues. While the uh, during the pandemic, um, touchless transaction is is inevitable and is welcome. However, um, there's we also need to pay attention to the security issues. For example, the QR code. Um, some. Uh, reports already mentioned that um, hackers can use a QR code to get access to account information and they can wipe out someone's account just in, in a matter of seconds. And uh, I just uh, came, I came across from, um, with the products and, uh, from Mobile Iron. They are um, offering zero sign on. Basically, it's a step up from single sign on with password, uh, I'm sorry, password uh, throughout the platform. But now they want to ditch the password part. The, um, the technology also utilizes QR. However, as I mentioned, it also has some drawbacks with the uh, hacking the QR code. Apparently, it's not a very difficult thing to do or redirect uh, with some malicious codes. So when we are working on our, te our technology, I think we should, uh, also need to keep in mind uh, the, the other side of the uh, technology. Right, right, Vivian. Thank you very much for pointing that out. And I think, uh, Dan, just like you mentioned, kind of setting the stage right off the bat, there is no choice around using technology. We have to use it in order to extend what uh, at least I call uh, human um, capabilities as, a, as an extension of crystallizing our imagination and, uh, you know, building something concrete in the world, extending our capabilities in the world. And, and what, you know, David just mentioned around uh, staying connected, but also, David, you mentioned um, surveillance, which is a big issue. And then Vivian has just talked about the security issues that kind of, again, talks to the resilience of the technology. So I'd really love to hear from uh, Dave here and, and Edson, you know, you've been in this in emerging tech at the cutting edge at the frontier of technology. What do you think are some of A, the issues and concerns, and what are we dealing with here? You know, talking about disruptive tech, uh, let's unpack that a little bit for our audience here. Sure, I'm happy to, to go next. So I'm David Brummer. I've been doing self-driving cars for 23 years. Uh, created a brain for a lot of different military robots and robots that had to do uh, autonomous operations in really difficult, dangerous environments. And I'll tell you, I think, you know, one of the big choices is whether humans end up adapting to the technology or whether the technology adapts to the humans. So I've really, you know, kind of taken a human-centered design approach, which actually I believe is better from an engineering perspective, because the human is really a critical part of the technology solution. And this is true not only for robotics, but it's true for how we structure our roads, how we structure things like ride sharing. Um, I think there's been really for two decades kind of an almost ridiculous uh, belief that if we just make robots autonomous, we make cars autonomous, that this will sort of solve our problems. But that is not the case at all. And it hasn't been for two decades. In fact, nothing is more surprising to me than all these really kind of supposedly smart investors who keep pouring billions of dollars into autonomous robots that are not at all what people want. And one of the points I've made is, you know, if you want a smart car, you should really have a smart ecosystem first. No matter how smart your car is, if you're trying to get through the Lincoln Tunnel and it's filled with cars, you can't think your way through that, and neither can an AI system. So one of the big things I've been really pushing for is a resurgence of swarm intelligence. And really all around us in biology, we see this, right? Whether it's 
how uh, ants work, how, how bees work, but also how we invest in the stock market, how we play soccer, right? We are also storm agents. Uh, the centralized control that I see emanating from companies right now, think of Amazon, right? Think of what Google is doing. Um, there's been sort of an awareness and almost intuitive awareness that to a large degree, humans are being turned into robots and not the right kind of robots, not the kind that has initiative and intrinsic intelligence, but really the kind who get told when to turn left, when to turn right, who to date, what books to read, right? These are influences that are being exerted on us, and it's not good, right? The level of anxiety has gone through the roof. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about what technology can and can't do for us. And my belief is that we need to distribute the control. And so really in the connected vehicle systems that we've been driving, the control is everywhere and nowhere, which is somewhat of a paradox, but it's literally an engineering reality, right? We don't want the critical motion of vehicles to depend on the cloud. That is wrong. It's wrong from an engineering perspective. It's also just plain wrong from a philosophical perspective. So a lot of the influence which is being exerted right now as technology where we're being told this is what you need i think we need to stand against that and say no thank you we do not want cloud-based control over our lives we want yes we want individual intrinsic intelligence yes we want ai all that's good but we also want to focus on for cars let's say the space between cars but more universally we, we want to focus on peer-to-peer -peer interaction between humans right and that's the key Right, right, right. Thank you for mentioning that. In fact, uh, Dave, uh, very interesting. And I think that is a perspective that is still an outlier in the space for many of us who are from a complexity science, network science perspective, understand uh, technology and most of our peers here not having a single point of failure, right? Distributed systems are not new. And, and all of this comes from biological realities of the planet. So we're tying it back to where complexity, swarm behavior comes from. Uh, thank you very much for, for bringing that perspective here. Uh, Edson, we haven't heard from you yet. Uh, and of course, you're involved in a number of initiatives around the world that are at the you know, defining, um, defining places, uh, including IEEE, IEEE. Uh, so it'd be great to hear from you. What you think are the biggest concerns right now? How do we um, you know, uh, tame the technology that's running Amic? Uh, that is very quite uh, quite interesting uh, discussion and also uh, question because I'm very enthusiastic with technology. I'm coming from the robotics, so I love to see the robots moving, fly, and so on. Uh, I, I, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote some papers about how robotics and artificial intelligence can attain the sustainable de development goals, uh, UN SDGs. Uh, but also, uh, I understand that uh, this kind of technology can also put uh, a lot of risk uh, undermine our rights as humans. We can see a proliferation of misuse of technology uh, those days. Like uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, most known problems is related to the uh, violation of our privacy. But you can see it also technology uh, make it the human uh, uh, relationship less human, so objectify human relationships. That's the reason why we have a proliferation of hate speech. We have the technology uh, with huge potential to degrade the environment. We have technology that you decide uh, who should uh, have a medical assistance, assistance or not. So that's the reason why I'm very involved with the ethics in human rights because uh, as a technology, I never realized the social impact of technology on human lives. Uh, in that sense, if you want to create uh, the technology, AI and robotics, digital technology in general, is necessary that we have a different uh, level of actuations. Since the infrastructure, as we mentioned, uh, some of the panelists mentioned before, we need to have a, a Infrastru digital infrastructure in terms of uh, internet connectivity, high, uh, high quality internet connectivity, but also in digital literacy. Otherwise, the people cannot reap the benefits of the digital domain. But we need also to create some regulations, soft laws in terms of standards, certification, and also in terms of hard regulations. I believe we will need 
soft regulation, uh, hard regulation, regulations. We have also collaboration inside the state and also outside the state because technology do, has not borders. So sometimes we have some problems that uh, uh, is stuck in the country that will affect another country. So it's necessary to have a, a collaboration across uh, uh, states. That's the reason why I'm, I'm very happy in C and the UN 750 declaration, uh, a paragraph where the member states have the commitment to reinforce the cooperation in the digital sphere. So mm -hmm. if you want to create uh, responsible technology is necessary that you, you see all the ecosystem, not only from the technical point of view, but anthropological point of view, social point of view. We need to be engaged uh, with government, civil society, private companies, and, and non-governmental -govern uh, organization. So we have a huge challenge because it's not easy to establish cooperation those days. We have a road right. of trust. Right, right, right. Uh, One of our partner organizations, uh, Martin Weinstein, who leads the Yale Open Lab, mentioned collaboration and, and then, uh, you know, partners there with yourself as well. Uh, collaboration is the technology we haven't uh, mastered yet. So uh, very well said, um, uh, Edson, to what you pointed out as to the, the multiplicity of perspectives that we need to see technology and also the digital economists. This is our mission to look at the socioeconomics of what the technology is embedded in because understanding that impact and building for that is the key. Um, so, you know, one of the questions I have you for the, for the panelists and given this is in line with the 75th anniversary of the UN General Assembly, um, is this enough? You mentioned uh, a paragraph. Um, so the extent of the digital economy is is huge, um, and uh, you know the the full value of what digital tech is doing is not fully accounted for in the global economy. Uh, definitely not in traditional measures around GDP and what have you. So we found ourselves we find ourselves at a point where um, there is a very fast moving. Um, cutting edge move towards building tech that's looking more and more like science fiction on one hand, uh, sort of inconsiderate of all these concerns you talked about around security, privacy, around um, what is the impact on humans, on the socioeconomics of it, even anthropological implications, what it's doing to our brain, because our brains are plastic, right? Um, and, and then we have the rest of the global economy. Um, and I was just having this conversation yesterday with, with a colleague who mentioned well, 2% of the population is going to create all the value and 98%, how do we find a purpose for them? So it's a provocative thing to say, um, how do we ensure that digital literacy that you talked about, that fact that uh, people who are in the economy are stakeholders, uh, what is it that needs to change from the way the incentives are currently aligned, uh, the business models as they exist currently, the way investments are are are, are being looked at uh, for us to see that human-centered um, set of outcomes that we just talked about and, you know, in achievement of the global goals as well. Maybe I'll, I'll say something about that. Um, what we're doing at the uh, Space and Web Foundation is um, – really uh, looking at the uh, probably the most significant event that's happened in the last 300 years since the printing press. And that was the invention of the internet itself in 1969. Uh, and that really was the first time that we created a decentralized network that was running on an open protocol, not owned by a commercial company. And so anybody could plug any kind of computer into that network. And we went from four computers in 1969 at UCLA, Stanford, Santa Barbara, and Utah, four computers. We have 40 billion computers plugged into the global internet today because we're running on an open global standard. Same thing happened in 1994. Tim Berners-Lee wrote a new protocol, HTTP. There were maybe eight web pages at the time. We have eight billion web pages today made by millions of people because it's decentralized. You don't have to ask permission. Have to follow the protocol, put it online. Oh, well, then that gives us a clue. The action is at the protocol level. 
when we make better protocols that link in autonomous vehicles, blockchains, IoT devices, AR, VR all together, then we get a new web that lays on top of this web of pages, and it's a web of things or spaces. And so we call that the spatial web. It's now an IEEE standard. Uh, spreading around the world, just like HTTP, sits in a nonprofit foundation, given away for free for everybody. So we think this is, and IEEE agrees with us, uh, they feel this is the next era in computing. Deloitte just put out a big uh, report on it uh, last month, uh, uh, saying the spatial web is the next era in computing because it does make everything interoperable. When you make a web page and you make it with HTTP and HTML, Google can index it and it connects to any other web page. But we don't have that in our other uh, technologies. Autonomous vehicles don't talk to our other IoT devices. Everything's kind of siloed. So these protocols are really critical because it unleashes the power of the crowd. And then you don't really have to worry about how do we get everybody involved. Everybody understands it. Look at all the people that made websites, right? It, we didn't have to uh, run around and wake them up. They just read about it. Wait, I can learn HTML and make a web page? Boom, up. And we have now 8 billion web pages. Same thing is going to happen in the next wave. We're going to tame these technologies, integrate them, and link them. And then we're going to add some new things we never added before. We're going to add self-sovereign identity. We're going to add uh, new levels of uh, location awareness and encryption. And that will give us data privacy and data protection so that we own our own data instead of being uh, surveilled. So there's a lot of uh, breakthroughs that are coming in this next decade that are going to solve some of the problems we're currently facing because the original uh, World Wide Web didn't have an identity layer, didn't have a uh, location uh, information, and didn't have any security level. Well, now we're adding those. So <clears throat> we're on the front edge of a, a, better, a better network, and that will engage everybody in the world in building it together as we did with the 8 billion web pages. Right, right. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Dan. So at the protocol level, build better tech uh, is what I'm hearing here. What else is, is, is key here, you know, talking about the socioeconomics? I'd love to hear from the other panelists as well. Uh, hi, I'm Vivian. I think I would like to uh, add to what Dan just said is that we need to encourage inclusive economy. The economy has to include everyone that we can enjoy our lives. Um, for example, I think, you know, the salary, the rich and the poor, the disparity, and especially after the pandemic is so huge. A lot of people cannot even afford a one bedroom apartment in California, San Francisco in particular. The housing issue is such a big problem that uh, one of the, my friends from there was saying that San Francisco looked like a third world. And I actually saw one report, a documentary from Deutsche Villa uh, made by Germans. And uh, it, it was uh, very hard for me to see some people, working people, working poor, lives in a van. And for that, I think next um, talk, I think we should be open up talk, uh, the uh, salary, this compensation has to be put on the table, not just $15 minimum wage, because like Amazon did, they raised the minimum wage to $15. However, they cut other benefits. So they are actually, the workers at Amazon actually get um, less than what they got before they raised the, uh, the wage $15 per hour. Mm -hmm. So technology workers in particular, I think what you're, you're alluding to here, Vivian, and the economic inequality and disparity that's increasing kind of, I think you raised a very important topic where what it is, uh, is focusing on is probably the notion of value over and beyond just, just money, but also value, exactly. right? Um, mm -hmm. How you actually measure uh, what you get in terms of the goods and services. Uh, so it's, and you mentioned a bunch of interesting things there. Um, I'm, you know, I'm really curious to hear, and of course, IEEE is at the cutting edge of a lot of the global um, industry regulation and standards. Um, what is it that we need to be doing currently um, to counter some of this surveillance, and, 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 and David, I'll come back to you on that, 
um, with satellite technology. What is it that we need to do as we speak to ensure that uh, we're building technology that is privacy preserving and not encroaching upon individual uh, rights, right? Um, and, and yet solves a purpose because we need that data in order to make informed decisions. Yeah, so on the positioning side, you know, GPS was a really important technology for helping us sort of orchestrate our world and increase efficiency. And I think it is really important that just like the internet, what Dan was talking about, GPS was created by government. It was created in a way where it was accessible to everyone and it's scalable. And, and I do think that that's an interesting model. As we look at how to enhance that GPS, I think it's important to keep this concept of public positioning. Even though we don't usually think of it that way, there are alternatives, right, where people basically get efficiency and safety and uh, other benefits based on how much money they, they put into the system. So that's one of the things that has to be looked at. Um, certainly, we're pushing for uh, enhanced GPS in a way that does indeed give people ownership of their own position data. And I think this is really critical. And to be clear, there are some countries, right, who when they look at our technology, they immediately want to use it for enforcement, they want to use it for tracking, um, and they want to use it to exert influence, right? And, and very specifically, they want what in a mathematical format we would call a time difference of arrival approach, which essentially means that the infrastructure is calculating your position. And if you're lucky, it'll tell you, right? The exact inverse of that is what we're doing, which is where your device calculates its position and you do what you want with that data. And so it is not an exaggeration to say this is literally one of the most important sort of moments in time for humanity, right? From this exact fork in the road, I can see two completely different civilizations emerging, right? And, and I don't think that's dramatic. I don't think that we understood when we invented GPS how much of an impact that would have on business, on military, on energy, um, and hopefully now we do. But imagine if we really have the ability to track people's location to centimeters indoors and outdoors uh, and to know their exact orientation, who they looked at, exactly what they were pointed out when they took a picture. Uh, these are things that have never been possible before. And so there's going to be a big change coming. And in some ways, it has to happen. We can't really do effective, scalable contact tracing, for instance, without this kind of positioning. We can't even really turn a scooter off if it goes you know, onto the sidewalk. Uh, this is one thing that many, many cities have asked us to do, and we have started doing it. Um, but it's, it's amazing, right? Because it, it, in many of these applications, really the difference between life or death is 10 centimeters. So, so there is a reason to have this kind of positioning. I just want to make sure it's done in the right way. And I think those are choices that have to be made right now. Right, right, right. David, uh, David Smith, curious to hear what your take on this is. Well, um, the position um, on security surveillance through satellite um, involves a lot of uh, different scenarios. And one of the scenarios I worked on was in Morocco. Um, they were... Um, the, the prison system was over 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 um, overpopulated, and some of the people that had means, um, they um, wanted to put them on um, house arrest. And um, what we had proposed, and they came to us, was a solution that could you know have them on ankle bracelets and track them via satellite. Uh, any place that they travel where they came in and they reported back to the, the main network. Um, and so for safety and security um, in areas that they don't have the, the infrastructure in place. Um, and so we put together that, 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 um, that solution for them um, to basically track all of these uh, different types of uh, inmates um, that have been released from prison because of the over overpopulation of the prison system. And also in, in Rihad or in Saudi, um, the problem they had with the terrorist piece was coming across the border and they don't have the, the network bandwidth to basically track the border. 
So that's when satellite came into play and we could <clears throat> basically do facial recognition, send emission critical data that's back to your mobile phone via satellite. And these are some of the things because when we're in this situation with um, the way our uh, society, security is always an issue. Um, if you really look at it, a lot of different transactions frauds has been way up over over the over the um you know over, over the web and so we have to be able to track track people that are in in that are behind this and be able to send the data back mission critical at real time as quickly as possible and that's something that satellite technology can do it's all of a matter of what is the problem what is the problem and how we customize the satellite solution for that situation and every and every scenario is different morocco might uh be um morocco um might be um dealing with this issue saudi might be dealing with this issue over in uh the congo the dnc uh we right. work on, on on the proposal that dealt with the with um the banking over the satellite because of you know, credit card numbers and stuff being taken. So these are some of the things that that's, that that we can put together to basically right, um, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, make sure that, 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 that takes place. Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, I think you've mentioned some really critical use cases, the kind of scenarios we don't often think about what governments are dealing with and an entire portfolio of global risks that governments run in, 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 in using technology towards some of that. So we have three minutes left. Um, I just want to hear from one or two panelists, and this is so timely right now. We have the presidential elections coming up, or we're in the middle of it, right? <laughs> next week, uh, next month, uh, and we'll know uh, kind of where the world's going to go, if that would be fair to say. Um, and, you know, obviously 2016 was this big year when the downside of this huge experiment of, you know, the global reach of digital tech uh, unfolded. And we saw what you've not seen before and, and, and something that's unprecedented where you have technology that's not properly regulated, uh, where the socioeconomic anthropological implications are not understood. It's the first time in the world that we are uh, running this experiment at this scale. And the consequences could be extremely dangerous. And, you know, from then on, I think this is something that is, of course, the, the front and center in all the debates around the actual build out of the tech. So perhaps, Edson, over to you, and since you're since you're in the in the circle, as with everybody else, but also I guess from a thought leadership academic perspective, where um, you know defining some of this, what does that? Uh, we got two minutes. What does that uh, look like? I should take one. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm very worried about that because, as I, as I mentioned, at the same time that technology can bring a lot of benefits to humanity, they can also put a lot of risk uh, to humanity. Like uh, we can use uh, technology to manipulate the, the choice, manipulate the human agents. So if you want to manipulate the election, you can use it, certainly artificial intelligence, uh, try to create a profile of the people, try to micro targets, uh, specific communities, try to uh, track minorities. So um, that can happen, but I, I'm not sure if you happen in that elections and the US election, but that can happen. One thing that you, you need to pay, pay very careful attention is how you can develop a technology in benefit of a society and take into consideration all the all list uh, problems of use. I'm not sure if I re answer you properly your question, but... Yeah, I think you've, uh, you've mentioned the concern and, and the task is up to us as stewards of technology to build tech that is responsible and tech that includes and considers all the other risks that we talked about right now. So we have 25 seconds left and I just want to take this time to thank everyone uh, who joined today for this panel, uh, just shared their tremendous insights and also want to thank everyone who joined as our um, audiences. Uh, definitely feel free to reach out to us 
Uh, you can easily find us on LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, you know, looking forward to building a better human centered future together. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. All righty. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. I think the recording um, should be okay for now. And uh, I will be in touch with all of you. We should, go, we, should, we should all we should all link up to uh, on LinkedIn and uh, share share what we're doing. And uh, I know uh, certainly David Brummer, uh, you and I should definitely talk. And uh, uh, I think Edson as well. And uh, I'd like to hear more of what you're doing, David Smith. And uh, same with Vicky. So I think it'd be great if we uh, made made a kind of a little uh, a communication network among ourselves. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. We are great players. Absolutely. Yeah. That sounds great, guys. Nice. Thank you. Thank Let's you. Make that happen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.